very good evening um, <clears throat> shri rajkiran rai ji chairman uh, united bank of india and chairman of iibf um, shri dinesh kumar khara ji uh, chairman state bank of india shri bishwar bishwakaran das ji um, dr murli dharan several ceos and mds of uh, of banks um, and dignitaries from the reserve bank of india and all esteemed uh, ladies and gentlemen who have taken time out of their busy schedule to to attend this uh, this talk uh, firstly let me say that i'm extremely privileged to be uh, delivering uh, this talk um, in some sense i'm actually quite humbled to be uh, delivering a lecture in the memory of uh, of of shri rk talwar <clears throat> let me just share my uh, presentation so i hope the presentation is visible yes sir it is visible okay so firstly um as has been mentioned um rajkumar talwar ji's uh, leadership was spiritually motivated um and i think that's why it's an enormous inspiration for all public serv servants but i especially rank myself as being fortunate to um have read about uh, his uh, his his exemplary leadership um i um after being invited for this lecture i actually ended up reading some of the you know really uh, good books that have been written especially by uh, shri vagul incidentally um, i'm sure uh, vagul sir will not remember but my first job was with icici when shri vagul was the chairman of of icici so reading his book and how um, he you know wrote so beautifully about the spiritually motivated leadership of uh, of rk talwar ji i think has been a big inspiration uh, i thought it would be best to actually take this quote um, from a case study uh, authored by ms shrinivasan uh, which is leading from the soul a case study on spirituality inspired leadership um, i think this is this captures in sense at least for me captures really well why um, talwar ji was so respected because the his leadership and his entire behavior actually came from a very deep um sense of you know of 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 spiritual uh, ethos which is of course uh, india's you know india's um real you know, strength um so the quote says can spirituality be the foundation for effective stewardship and elevate the le level of leadership from the average to extraordinary heights that's a question um and the answer is the life of an exemplary banker rk talwar provides an affirmative answer to this question what makes talwar stand apart as a leader is his exemplary character moral courage and spiritual dedication which evoked respect and admiration from everyone who came into contact with him and inspired countless young officers to lead a life of integrity and values i think um, this is um, captured very beautifully if uh, talwar ji's soul is listening to this um, he would agree that the bhagavad gita um, you know chapter 3 shloka 21 captures this very very beautifully yad yad acharati shreshtatah tat tat evetaro janah sayat pramanam kurute lokas tad anuvartate yad yad acharati shreshtatah clearly talwar ji was a shresht yad yad acharati shreshtatah so his acharan his own behavior leadership by example yad yad acharati shreshtatah tat tat evetto janah so that that's how his followers those who get inspired by him follow him i think that is being reflected so well in this quote so many you know countless young officers actually he inspired them to lead a life of integrity and values yad yad acharati shreshtatah tat tat evetto janah sayat pramanam kurute i think this is by far possibly the most important part of this shloka it's not just the words 
but praman actually proof proof of behavior praman sayat pramanam kurute lokas ad anuvartate it's a proof of behavior actually that's what inspires not talk um, and i think in that sense um, just reading about him and as a public servant i've been really inspired by the spiritually motivated leadership um, in some sense if you were to capture again using india's spiritual ethos his karma was driven by his dharma uh, i think and that's the best way to to really conduct oneself um, you know especially one one is given the privilege of of um, of serving the country um, so I, i i feel again that india's covid response which is what i'm going to talk about uh, talwar ji's soul would be really happy with with the principles that have uh, motivated india's covid response because they are also indeed grounded in a lot of you know of of uh, moral courage um, and and spiritual dedication <clears throat> so um if you recall around march um when the cases were increasing in a lot of you know a lot of countries um there was a lot of uncertainty about how the pandemic is going to spread um i remember reading a lot of you know uh, work at that time and many of us would have all come to know about this what is called this r not parameter parameter r not which captures how likely one person how many people is that one person likely to infect because a pandemic spreads based on network effects so if that r not parameter is about you know 2.4 2.5 then every person who is infected infects another two and a half per, you know people and each of those people then infect more and that's how the pandemic spreads and incidentally this is what um, so there were a lot there was a lot of variation in this while um you know uh, pandemics like ebola for instance had r not of in excess of 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 four um the common you know common flu that comes every year in you know in 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 many countries um has an r not parameter of 1.5 1.6 and when one was reading you know research on this even epidemiologists were not sure at that time whether the r not parameter will be 2.5 2.3 what is, which is what the spanish flu by the way also had Uh, or will it be actually higher and especially for india and i think this is something which i actually must before i talk about the policy response which is what i'm captured in this slide i think it's really important to understand you know what policy makers faced around around march with this uncertainty remember we actually are a population of almost 1.4 billion people just the state of uttar pradesh has more you know people than the entire country of brazil you know uttar pradesh more than the entire country of brazil um if you take the population of bihar and maharashtra which is which are your second and third largest um, you know populous states in the country they have more you know greater population each of those st states has a greater population than uk and germany put together um uh, now in order to understand what this means in terms of you know the population and the population density let me give you a simple example you know and uh, most of you bankers are from are from bombay so you will relate to what i'm what i'm talking about in the mumbai locals when i was working in icici i used to take a local from goregaon which is where the icici quarters were to uh, you know to to church gate um, where, where where the off uh, the office um, of of icici say was at that time before it moved to pkc i'm talking about you know 1999 2000 i'm sure many you know many uh, others here um, also in their younger years would have traveled by the mumbai local um, so you'll relate to what i'm talking about on average you know in a coach in a mumbai local there are about 500 people who are traveling on average um, and and you know it's so densely packed now if suppose one person is infected in that in that coach um, and let's say you know a person is traveling from borivali to church gate typically about a 55 55 minute to an hour journey uh, in that period or for that matter let's say from thane to you know to um, to vt either um, about an hours journey in that hours journey because they are all packed into one coach that one person within just one hour time can infect the entire 500 people now keep that that's one scenario and of course you know uh, locals were stopped therefore um, and something which was actually a good move but now contrast that with suppose the same 500 people are working from home um, each one of them is working from home following social distancing wearing masks etc uh, and by the way 
wearing mask would not have necessarily be that you know that that useful in the in the mumbai local because of the you know the the, the distance is such so so low and uh, you know the uh, the the, the uh, bodily juices can actually can can, can spread uh, so if these people are working from home the same 500 people to get infected from one infected person might have taken days or weeks um, you know so one hour in one hour you can actually infect you know when the population density is higher and population is high that's why i've used the example of the mumbai local you know a coach compared to you know let's say you know, being at home in one hour 500 people can get infected while if these people are actually socially distanced and density is lower population you know they're not interacting as much it could take days or or, or you know or even weeks so this gives you the contrast for now take this example and relate it to india versus other countries because for one we have a much higher population as i already talked about 137 you know uh, um, crore people second we live in one of the most densely populated areas in the world um, especially those at the bottom of the pyramid um, and and therefore you know following social distancing etc is not that easy um so the mumbai local versus the you know versus people working from home now take the mumbai local as equivalent of india and you know working from home as the equivalent of other countries with much less population much less population density you can see that the pace of spread could have been much higher you know one hour versus let's say a few days in india versus versus the rest of the world so this is the key aspect that you know uh, one one was facing around around march um together with that given the health infrastructure given our population it was possible that our health infrastructure could have been overburdened and as a result might have actually you know i might have led to a lot of lot of fatalities as well i must point out actually you know those of you who are interested can go and read this i remember reading a a, a paper that was put out by john hopkins university and princeton university on 24th of march i remember the date also exactly uh, where they had actually laid out three different scenarios three different scenarios for india um, and they had said that in the in the best case scenario best case remember and uh, then when when i talk about what actually has happened you know keep this in mind in their best case scenario the peak for india was in the month of june in the month of june and the worst case scenario they had talked about was in the month of april um, you know some somewhere around mid april to 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 end april now you know the, i i think they were actually doing this projection given you know what i have just talked about the population the population density etc so their models were indeed actually predicting based on you know the population the population density but that is what india could have actually faced you know a peak hitting and those peaks had you know several uh, uh, millions of cases tens of millions of cases and millions of deaths that's what they were actually projecting at in fact crores of cases and millions of deaths is what they were they were projecting you know as as part of that peak so imagine if the peak of several crores of cases hitting around you know around even even june in the best case scenario the kind of you know fatalities etc that would that have manifested so that's the vulnerability that's the situation india faced around march um and this is where now let's think about how you know what was the what was the main policy that actually drove india's india's response um so uh, firstly uh, so india's re india's response policy response was guided by research in epidemiology and economics uh, there is a lot of research you know there's been a lot of research on the spanish flu episode for instance you know which happened in 1918 Uh, which focused on not only the health outcomes but the economic outcomes as well um, and what what were the impact of lockdowns during that time uh, similarly on the epidemiological side what is the impact of higher population density higher population in the spread of the of of a virus like the, like the like covid-19 there was a lot of research um, you know on on this um, and and i'm going to just lay out some bits of this the first chapter in this year's economic survey gives all the details for those of you who are interested but i'll just give you the the summary of you know the key research that actually drove india's policy and the principles um firstly uh, this is you know um, lars hansen and tom sargent um uh, who whom i had the privilege of learning from at the university of chicago 
Tom Sargent, you know, um, uh, it was uh, was a professor at, the, at New York University. He's also a professor now at New York University. But he was visiting the University of Chicago when I was in my second year learning macroeconomics. So both of these Nobel laureates um, who had written in a paper in 2001 that when faced with enormous uncertainty, and that is so apt to the situation that India was facing around March, when faced with enormous uncertainty, policies must aim to minimize large losses. So, you know, the, 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 that research was really apt for what countries were facing around March because enormous uncertainty. How long will the pandemic be? How you know, fast will it spread? What is the R0 parameter? You know, especially for a country like India with such large population, population density, etc. You know, enormous uncertainty. So the recommendation there, very clear, was that policies must aim to minimize large losses. And one of the things that I have generally generally believed in is that good policy making, whether at the corporate level or at the national level, it comes from clarity of objectives. You know, if your objectives are very clear, then I think that leads to very good, um, uh, uh, you know, policy making. So this uh, gave a very good, very clear objective that it has to be about minimizing large losses. Now the question is, what were those large losses? Is this are they are we talking about in in GDP terms, monetary terms, or what is it that we are talking about when faced with a pandemic? And India, I think actually here's where you know um, I, I I feel like the Alwarji's soul would really you know um, be happy with how India thought about the, the about loss faced with the pandemic. India identified large loss as loss of human lives. Um, and actually really understood that while GDP growth will come back, um, and it certainly has, which is you know very heartening for all of us uh, to note, but while GDP growth will come back, a human life that is lost can never ever be brought back. Um, and I think that humane principle is what actually was, you know, led to us uh, realizing that large loss is basically last loss of human lives. So minimizing loss of human life has to be the first if you know faced with this unprecedented pandemic um, you know for the first time in 100 years after the spanish flu episode by the way isma also another important thing to remember you know in the spanish flu episode the maximum number of deaths were in india you know if you go and read history and actually read the uh, you know the episode for the uh, Spanish Spanish flu. India had the maximum deaths uh, at that time. Another another important fact that actually also you know sort of we had to uh, you know, keep in mind with enormous humility. Um, India's response also actually stemmed, as I said, from you know this humane principle. It's advocated very eloquently in the Mahabharata. Apadi prana raksha hi dharmasya pratham ankuraha. Apadi, apada, you know, basically difficulty. Apadi prana raksha, raksha, you know, saving a life. Apadi prana raksha hi dharmasya pratham ankuraha. Ankur is basically the, you know, the, the, the first origins that come. So the origin of dharma is saving a life that is in jeopardy. That is what Mahabharata actually has talked about. Apadi prana raksha hi dharmasya pratham ankuraha. And, and that is what actually, when you combine, you know, what economics recommended, economic research recommended with this principle that all of us have actually learned, you know, uh, at some stage in our lives, all of us have actually, you know, uh, heard about the Mahabharata, especially the Bhagavad Gita, which is a you know, big part of Mahabharata. But this is one principle which basically said, therefore, you know, the big, uh, you know, uh, a loss can be that of human lives faced with faced with this pandemic, and therefore the key objective that was taken was to minimize loss of human life, recognizing that GDP growth will come back, but human lives once they are lost, you know, cannot be brought back. And those of us who actually lost our loved ones at some point or the other, you know, I in two thousand uh, in in two thousand five, I had lost my 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 father who's basically whom I owe enormous debt of gratitude to for whatever I am today. And so, you know, we can relate to such, such, such tragedy. And, and therefore, I think uh, very few people will, will, will disapprove that, that minim, that, you know, uh, minimizing loss of human life was the most important objective to pursue at this point in time. And for this, what did, what did we need to do? And what was it, what was, what did research point out? That the pandemic curve needs to be flattened. Why does it need to be flattened? Because if the pandemic, you know, hits its peak, let's say around April, May or June, 
then the loss of life that could have happened would have been far far higher i'll give you some some numbers here just arithmetic to you know to to explain this um so india's um, you know uh, india's fatality rate now is is about 1 and 1/2 less than 1 and 1/2% but around april uh, you know may around april and may the fatality rate was around 4.5% but 4 to 4.5% uh, if i you know uh, if if i remember my numbers right um now do remember that this 4 to 4.5% actually was with much lower cases because india had the most intense lockdown before we had even hit 100 cases actually so at much lower just a few thousand cases the mortality rate was 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 4 and 1/2% or though there about now it's easy to 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 sort of you know project from these that if we had you know several crores of cases by you know mid april or uh, you know or or early june which is what this these research studies had recommended then the mortality rates would have certainly be been higher than 4 and 1/2 you know 5% remember you know why that rate has come down from 4 and 1/2 to 1 and 1/2 is because of the learning so even the entire medical fraternity has learned how to deal with the pandemic but early on around april around may you know they were also learning how to deal with this pandemic so at that time without adequate learning happening if we were hitting several crores of cases just in april or you know or 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 may then you can actually do the counterfactual that the mortality rates would have been much higher may have been 6 7% you take 6 7% multiplied by a few crores of cases you basically get what might possibly have been you know how many deaths would we have been we and our loved ones would have been grieving at if basically the pandemic curve had you know did, were, were not flattened so the first key recommendation was was that the pandemic curve needs to be flattened um, what that means is you know a much higher peak is flattened so that the peak happens much later um, and as a result the health infrastructure the test testing infrastructure all of that gets time to be to 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 respond to this to this pandemic uh, you know and in you know for instance the, the this is this is if you look at the testing uh, laboratories laboratories that were created within a few months the entire testing infrastructure was ramped up significantly and that really helped in testing you know and one of the things that we actually find in our in in this chapter is that those states that actually tested far more you know um, were the ones that were able to manage the pandemic very well but that would not have been possible unless the we gain time by flattening the curve to be able to create that testing infrastructure and the health infrastructure so that was first thing which was pandemic needs to be curve need to need to be flattened the second key point was something that i've already illustrated that the pandemic spreads faster in higher denser populations and that's because of the network effects that that you know uh, much like the you know uh, the the digital uh, transactions network for instance you know all of you bankers would be familiar with that that in a higher network the pace of spread of the digital transactions is much higher that's what the network effect is same thing could have, could have happened actually in the pandemic as well and and this was a very crucial piece of you know of of research that was that highlighted that the intensity of the lockdown mattered the most at the beginning of the pandemic um, you know an early intense lockdown you know the return on investment in on that actually would have been much much more than having a lockdown later because that's when the spread is very fast um, awareness is not that high you know and so uh, the intensity of the lockdown matters most at the beginning of the pandemic the other key uh, you know important input that came from this was research from the spanish flu pandemic was that the early intense lockdown not only does it does it you know save more human lives but also enables quicker better economic recovery and this was you know there was a nice re- piece of research um, which looked at cities in the united states and showed that that you know cities that had a very intense lockdown during the spanish flu early intense lockdown they were able to save deaths you know a lot more mortality rates were much lower but at the same time the recovery was also much faster so in some sense by taking that short term pain of an early intense lockdown these cities were were able to have a win 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 in terms of saving lives win in in terms of the economic recovery as well 
And so these two pieces of research were actually very critical in, in us thinking about actually an early lockdown and you know having to pay some of the short term costs for that, but thereby hoping that the gains in terms of lives and in terms of the economic recovery, you know, we could we, we could obtain that. So so these were the, some of the key ideas from research that actually guided India's India's policy response. Now, uh, given that, how has India done in terms, uh, you know, across countries? How, how, have we, how have the various states done? Is something that I'm going to show you now. Um, so, this chart shows the difference between estimated cases and actual cases. Estimated cases. Why do we need to look at estimated cases? Because, as I mentioned earlier, that if your population is higher, if your population density is higher. If you're, you know, um, let's say if you're not testing adequately, if you are, you know, um, you, you have a much older population, all these affect the, you know, potential the number of cases that could have been. Because whenever we have to evaluate the impact of a policy, we have to look at what actually transpired versus what could have been. And that the difference between what, what actually transpired and what could have been is basically the, you know, the impact of the policy controlling for all other confounding factors, other factors that might impact, which I'll come to, you know, later, but that's the way you evaluate the, the, the policy response. So that's why, you know, the economic survey actually did this estimation using all the characteristics that matter research that, you know, epidemi epidemiological research has highlighted in terms of cases and deaths. Uh, we estimated the actual cases that could have been for a country and then, you know, uh, 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 estimated and then uh, subtracted it from the actual cases. So what you see is, you know, cases and deaths and for deaths, by the way, we took into account not only the, you know, these factors, which is population, population density, demographics, the, uh, the older population, especially, but we also took the health infrastructure into account because, as I mentioned, if your health infrastructure can get overburdened because it's not adequate to respond to the pandemic, that actually led to, you know, can lead to more deaths. So deaths has also the health infrastructure, you know, uh, in, in the estimation methodology. Now, here you notice that on both, you know, cases and deaths, India has done really well. Um, India, according to the survey's estimation, has saved about 37 lakh cases. So, you know, um, as, 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 as a result of the policy and has saved, you know, more than one lakh lives, one lakh lives actually. So imagine, you know, one lakh families could have lost somebody who's dear to them, you know, but for, but for the humane policy response. Um, and, uh, you know, again, we all know that the psychological impact that there is, you know, when a family loses a loved one is just enormous and that can have e economic impacts as well. Also important to keep in mind, you know, in the Indian context, especially families at the bottom of the pyramid, um, typically have five members with one bread earner. And that one bread earner is, you know, a lot more vulnerable to catching the pandemic because he would, you know, he would have, he or she would have had to go and actually work. Um, and then, you know, losing that bread earner can actually mean that the other four would be, would be facing, you know, destitution, um, especially those at the bottom of the pyramid. Undoubtedly, you know, the lockdown and the, the economic impact of the pandemic, um, not only in India, but all over the world have, the, have had their impact on the poor families, especially. But, you know, the thing could have, things could have been far worse if the bread, bread earners actually had had, you know, had, had been lost by families, the amount of, you know, deprivation and the, um, you know, and, and destitution that could have happened from these one lakh deaths and one lakh families having to face this would have been far, far higher. Uh, if you look at those, uh, you know, countries, the usual suspects, uh, United States um, has had about 62 lakh more cases than what should have been there, given their population, population density, demographics, etc. Um, also, remember, you know, one thing I must mention in the cost, you know, context of deaths, a lot of people mention that India has a young population. India has a young population, that is true. But what is also true is that in sheer numbers, the people who are 60 plus is more than, you know, many countries put together. So as a proportion of the population, we may have lower than other countries, 
but in sheer magnitude you know and and deaths don't go by proportion of population they actually go by the actual magnitudes of the elderly population so that's also something that we had to keep in mind you know and so we saved 1 lakh uh, lives effectively through the uh, now many of you will wonder is it because of the lockdown is it because of you know is 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 the survey attributing to you know to the to the policy what may have happened because of other factors that we are more immune you know we have basically bcg vaccination we live in an environment which gives more immunity i will you know come to all of those all of those potential uh, you know uh, uh, aspects i'll come to that uh, in a minute but before that let me just show you how states have done the same analysis that i showed you across countries we then replicated across states as well same way you know for instance some states have a lot more dense populations than others and states like uttar pradesh for instance have much higher population and so they may actually have um, you know uh, much higher cases um, so when you look at the states here um, maharashtra has been the you know the the the, the negative outlier in terms of both cases and deaths you know if, if you remember in the in the case in the cross country case actually the same country was not you know uh, was not the, uh, the the worst performer but among states you know in terms of cases and deaths maharashtra has been the worst and again this will this is something that will you all will be able to relate to i am sure um, if you look at the the good performers on deaths Uh, Kerala, Telangana, and Andhra Pradesh have saved the most amount of lives. They are the top three in terms of saving lives. While on cases, it's Uttar Pradesh, Gujarat, and Bihar uh, that have actually been able to. And you know, this is primarily because of better testing, much higher testing. You know, which is why they actually were able to you know control the the case load uh, much better than. And in fact, if you go and look at the the testing, you will see that this actually relates. Uh, uh, you know, the management of the pandemic also had a Had, had significantly, you know, to do with that level of testing that was being done. Some states, for instance, did not test adequately for fear of finding out cases, but that ended up being actually, you know, uh, uh, more hurtful in the in the in the long run. Now, this is something which is important to to uh, to understand. So, you know, in the survey, we've also shown that the difference between estimated and actual cases. act correlates with the stringency of the lockdown you know uh, ac across countries i am not showing that here just for brevity uh, but i'm going to focus on the on the uh, you know state level variation now um, many of you would know that oxford university came up with this index that uh, you know ranked the countries in terms of the stringency of their lockdown uh, what the survey has done is and, and that you know a lot of credit goes to the the team you know the team which actually worked very hard to replicate this index at the state level in india by going and you know reading all the mha orders ministry of home affairs orders across different states and state level you know policies as well they actually after understanding the oxford university index they replicated this index for the for, for indian states as well so what i'm showing you here is the change in the stringency so the you know from during june to august um, how uh, up until june if you remember you know all states were under a common national like lockdown so the change from june to august because the during this time states were basically you know implementing these policies and correlating that with the difference between the estimated and the actual cases so what this shows is that those states that actually had a much more stringent lockdown you know where the ones that were able to save on cases they actually did much more actual cases were lower than their estimated and on deaths as well so stringency correlated significantly and these are you know for those of you who are with an economist bent of mind these correlations are statistically significant as well um in in terms of the you know the correlation and so the correlation of the change in stringency with both the cases and deaths in terms of the difference between estimate versus actual is is quite strong now this is where i actually come to does correlation mean causality um you know interestingly uh, and you know uh, because this is a lecture in the memory of uh, rk talwar ji i am uh, inclined to mention a story from the kathopanishad uh, on 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 the difference between correlation and causality Uh, in the kathopanishad there is this there is a story of a crow coming and sitting on the branch of a tree and just as the crow comes and sits on the branch of a tree a fruit falls 
Now, these are correlated events, the crow coming and sitting and the fruit falling. But the crow thinks that it made the fruit fall. So the crow's thinking is a causal relationship that I came and sat on the branch of on the branch of the tree and therefore the fruit fell. That is why I caused the fruit to, to, to fall. So crow coming and sitting first, the outcome after. And you know, uh, it's it's a it's a that's that's a causal statement that indeed, you know, that's that move is what led to the fruit falling. But here's where actually, and you know, the the, the uh, talks beautifully about how it's possible that that particular branch on which the crow came came and sat on, you know, the fruit may have been very right. And so the fruit fell, confounding factor, something that is actually not related to the crow coming and sitting on the branch of the tree. Also, then, you know, another factor that maybe a gush of wind flew at that time, you know, uh, and which made the fruit fall, not the crow coming. So other factors and then says that if you can show that neither a you know a, a, a wind flew nor or nor was this was it the case that this fruit was especially ripe this fruit was similar to every other fruit on the branch of the tree and yet the crow coming and sitting actually made the made the fruit fall then you can claim that this is a causal effect in other words if you control for all other factors that could have made the fruit fall then you can then say that it's a crow coming and sitting on the branch of the tree that's what made the fruit fall in other words you go from correlation to causality by taking care of all other factors all other confounding factors that's what you know in fact incidentally as economists are trained you know we do two years of phd coursework to learn how to go from correlation to causality by taking care of all the confounding factors so i'm not going to bore you with the details but in this context of the policy, COVID policy, it's very important to ask this question. Uh, before I come to that, let me actually also show you the impact on the eco economy, economic indicators. So here, what we are showing is the same change in stringency and the change in the in in you know the electronic toll count, uh, the value of that, and the numbers also. Um, and second, if we high frequency indicator that we are showing here is the eway bill. Um, you know, uh, because these are available at a monthly level, that's why we've used this data. Now, what you notice is that the the change in the stringency had a, ch a change, you know, negative correlation in the same month. In other words, if the lockdown was very stringent, that brought down the high frequency indicator in that month. But if you look at this with a three month lag, this is actually this variable is a three month lag. So this month, a high, very stringent lockdown brought down the economic indicator. But three months later, the same stringency also leads to actually a recovery. That's your V-shaped recovery, which is basically what has been seen in the GDP as well. High frequency indicators, which is coming from the stringent correlated to the stringency of the lockdown. Now, let me actually talk about the causality, you know, whether are these correlations, what I've shown you in the previous slide and in this slide, are these correlations? or are these indeed causal can we attribute this to the to the stringency of the lockdown itself or is it something else so let me let me talk about that because that's really important too so as i you know mentioned with the story from the kathapanishad to show causal impact we need to show that other factors are not counting for this correlation what could have been you know these other factors be oh it could be that india has higher you know indians have higher immunity than others um, you know, it could be that the BCG vaccine that all of us have gotten and maybe which other countries, especially advanced economies, do not administer, you know, that provides us in immunity against the pandemic. It could be that the environment that we live in, you know, which is quite different from that in the advanced economies, maybe gives us immunity and therefore reduces deaths intrinsically. Or maybe we are just basically better equipped to handle pandemics compared to other countries, you know, Indians are just by nature, you know, more resilient to handle a pandemic. It could be anything else at the, that is, but the intensity of the lockdown. So, and, you know, we're taking into account the potential criticism that any critic will say, you know, what about this? What about that? You know, what about X, Y, Z, anything that is at the India level that is, you know, peculiar to India. Now, here, what I just showed you was the strong correlation of cases and deaths across states with the stringency of the lockdown. I just last two slides of that's what I showed you. Also, I showed you a similar negative contemporaneous correlation and a positive lag correlation with the economic indicators, the V-shaped recovery. Both of these were correlations with the stringency of the lockdown. 
Now, here's where I think the state level analysis becomes really very important that anything that is peculiar to India, if suppose, you know, it's BCG vaccine, right? People in Maharashtra have gotten BCG vaccine. People in Kerala have gotten BCG vaccine. People in Karnataka have gotten, you know, BCG vaccine. People in Uttar Pradesh have gotten it. Gujarat, every state has gotten that, you know, that the BCG vaccine. If it is that Indians on average are, have higher immunity, then every state, Maharashtra, Uttar Pradesh, Bihar, Gujarat, every state, basically this is a statement about Indians. So every Indian has, has more immunity. If it is the case that the environment in India is actually is different, you know, and, and you know, let's, let's say less clean and that's why it gets us more immunity. That is cl less clean across all states compared to the advanced economies. Um, you know, it's true for every state. So now, if you have something that is common across all states, that cannot lead to a correlation, you know, across, across, you know, across states, because anything that is common will get netted out actually. So the correlation that I showed you in the previous charts cannot come from, you know, from India specific or some India peculiar factor. I think that's a very important point. And that's why I put it in red here that anything peculiar to India must be common to all states. So differences across states that leads to this correlation cannot stem, stem from factors that are specific to India. So, you know, the, what, what we've seen in the across countries, India's better performance cannot come from just something that is specific to India because same pattern we are seeing across states in India as well. So, you know, as in the, in the, in the that story from Kathopanishad, if we have ruled out that India specific factors could not have explained the, you know, higher, you know, uh, the, the much better health outcomes or the V-shaped reco economic recovery, then that means that basically it's a policy that we implemented. And as you recall, that policy was implemented based on careful research that drove that policy. That is indeed what had a causal impact on saving lives and on economic recovery. I think this is very crucial to actually to, to, to understanding that it is, you know, that, that the credit must be given to, you know, to, to the decision makers. And I actually must say, eventually it's the decision makers, you know, people like us can only recommend. Uh, and so, you know, we don't deserve credit because it's a decision maker, you know, they, they have to actually take the costs that, that they, you know, that come with the decision as well, because they are the ones that get criticized as well. So for them to have had the courage to take the short term pain, for long term gain, the credit has to go to them, you know, in, in implementing, you know, this, this, uh, far, this far sighted uh, policy. Um, so, and this is also important to, you know, last bit on the, you know, on, on the, on, on the health part. And then I will talk about the economic policies that the country implemented. Now, even without the intense lockdown, it's important to understand that even if we did not have the lockdown, the Im impact on the econ economy would have certainly be there as you have seen with other countries as well, who did not have as intense a lockdown, yet their economy has suffered. Why? Because individuals would not have gone out anyway because of the fear of catching the pandemic. Even absent a lockdown, many individuals would not have gone out anyway. Contact-based service sectors would have been severely impacted because of this, because you know those of us who we're going for a massage or maybe to a beauty parlor or for a haircut. Many, all these actually, we, you know, we, 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 we reduced it significantly. We started some of that in a very careful manner only during the unlock phase. So this would have, those would have been impacted. And importantly, the precautionary motive to save. Um, this is just economic jargon in some sense to, let me put it in simple terms that every household when faced with uncertainty around March or, or April, if they had some money, let's say 20,000, 30,000 rupees that they had as savings, let's say, rather than going and buy, buying, let's say, you know, a, 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 a discretionary item, maybe a television or, or some other item, the family would have thought that let's keep this money because we may need it if somebody goes, becomes sick, given the pandemic. So let's not go and spend this money. That is what is basically the precautionary motive to save. When uncertainty is very high as it is, you know, when there is a crisis, people, all households actually save a lot more. Now, if every household thinks the same way, that let's not spend on, you know, what they will call it unnecessary items at this point in time, just focus on essentials, then discretionary spending would have indeed come down in the economy, you know, and it did, you know, uh, it, even, even without the lockdown, this would have happened. 
and the risk aversion and the uncertainty of demand would have impacted corporate investment as well corporates you know because investment is irreversible it is basically long gestation typically and it's bulky um, you know they don't invest unless there is certainty of demand and there isn't enough there isn't risk aversion so given the risk aversion and the uncertainty of demand corporate investment would have any way gone down as well so both consumption and investment would have declined as a result of just the pandemic pure effect of the pandemic so even without the lockdown the pandemic would have created significant economic impact which is which it has by the way you know those of you who follow the imf reports for instance the june uh, uh, june 2020 report the world economic outlook had mentioned that if you look at the proportion of countries where you know where gdp is going to decline this year it's the highest in a one and a half centuries highest in a 150 years so so you know that is that was just the pure effect of the pandemic you know with or without the lockdown um, they they had because many other countries did not have this kind of lockdown and yet the impact of the pandemic has been there what a lockdown has done you know what it did was it ensured a coordinated response Uh, and thereby saved lives and enabled the v-shaped recovery because you know all of us in india we we often times have this chalta hai kind of attitude many times we may not have appreciated the severity of the pandemic you know and and this coordinated response that the lockdown brought in and the you know understanding of the enormity of that pandemic you know i think that coordinated uh, coordination actually really helped in saving lives and in enabling the v-shaped economic recovery uh now having talked about the health uh, a policy you know now let me talk to the other part which is actually something that i mentioned as i if you recall i'd mentioned that research from the spanish flu pandemic had shown that an early intense lockdown not only helps the you know the the uh, saving life but also enables a robust economic recovery which is what india is seeing now um, you know uh, during the unlock phase so let me also talk about the economic policies that that basically you know has helped with this uh, you know as has led to this to this to this uh, recovery firstly let me you know uh, talk about this is basically a chart of the balances uh, in the pradhan mantri janthan yojana i think you know i'm in some sense here i'm preaching to the converted because you all are bankers you would have seen this yourself what what happened um but you know in terms of the aggregate numbers you may have all seen it in your individual banks but you know we see it at the aggregate macroeconomic level uh, these 40 crore odd accounts that are at the bottom of the pyramid the reason i'm showing this is because typically uh, people at the bottom of the pyramid they consume almost everything that they earn you know typically uh, and economists say that the marginal propensity to consume for such households at the bottom of the pyramid is close to one um, in other words if they get 100 rupees they likely to save they they likely to consume the entire 100 rupees so they're not likely to save as much and that is why i'm using you know the the uh, the numbers from this section of society notice that during the lockdown phase that in these accounts the average balance increased by 400 rupees um, look at the sharp increase here um, this is because of course essentials were provided for you know by far the largest um, uh, you know a food for, for free food program 80 crore people was were given i think that might be the largest uh, free food program ever in the world 800 million people so the essentials were taken care of direct benefit transfers were also provided to the vulnerable sections of society uh, you know and that is why you see this increase in these balances if they were you know if if they were spending then uh, you know then this balance increase would not have happened so 400 rupees times basically 40 crore accounts about 16000 crores of you know uh, of basically increase happened in the in these accounts you know um, and of course has since come down during the lockdown phase but even then is like the, the average balance is higher than the pre covid phase that's something you know as of 1st december it's still higher than uh, which i'm sure you're seeing in your own you know uh, deposit books as well um, the the uh, pmjdy balances <clears throat> uh, the reason i'm pointing this out is that this shows that the during the period of uncertainty discretionary spending would not have increased um, and and something that i you know one number line yeah there's some disturbance 
yes uh, uh, the md uh, secretary of uco bank uh, request you to please put it on mute uh, i think they have muted sir you can continue okay yeah thank you so much thank you um, so the the pmjdy balances increased significantly um, and as a, as a result the um, you know th th this is illustrating the fact that a lot of um, you know uh, 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 this this is illustrating the fact that the discretionary spending would not have increased at this at at, at this time um, central government expenditure basically increased during this period um, you know after during the unlock phase if you see up at the, up until september the you know expenditures did not increase as much but from october you see that government has stepped up its capital capital expenditure increased by about 130% in october 250% in november and 82% in in december now the idea behind this was that india's policies you know at the at the start of the pandemic were focused purely on ensuring necessities as i said the free food program uh, this was optimal given the uncertainty and the resultant precautionary motives to save and simple idea which is that if you think about a car you know when the brakes are clamped on the car pushing on the accelerator at that time does basically only waste fuel and the and that fuel in this in this uh, context was the the fiscal fiscal uh, space that we had which was you know which was not very large it was we didn't want to waste it at that time and that is why india actually saved and focused on only, only on the essentials in the in the during the first 6 months um because economic activities were restricted and so people anyway if you gave cash as well they wouldn't have been able to go and spend it on discretionary items so it did not make sense to actually go and you know and and give uh, give 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 transfers at that time but during the unlock phase calibrated demand side measures have been announced um you know and now with the budget as you would you know recall and i'm going to just spend some time on that the demand has really been pushed significantly uh, using the 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 uh, focus on the national infrastructure pipeline as well that is what is being seen in the central government expenditures that i showed you in this chart um um if also india recognized very well that the impact of the pandemic is not only on the demand side but on supply side as well that the disruptions in labor markets and financial distress of firms could lead to loss of productive capacity therefore a slew of structural reforms were announced to enhance supply in the medium to long term um, and thereby avoid loss of productive capacity these reforms primarily focus on strengthening the primary and secondary sectors of the economy uh, these are your primary is basically your agriculture secondary is manufacturing which create a lot of jobs in the economy and thereby can you know really enable aggregate demand streamlining of labor laws broad based reforms in agriculture msmes services power mineral sector space defense you know all these have been announced slew of reforms and what is, what i think is extremely crucial the strategic psu policy that was announced at, as part of atmanirbhar bharat 1 um, and has been also the implementation of that has been announced in this budget as well uh, which will enable productivity improvements as well significantly in in the economy so all of these will have significant supply side impacts on you know going forward um if we so now let me just uh, you know highlight some key principles on the you know what what drove our economic response um so firstly if you only increase demand um then you get you may get growth in the short term but you'll also get significant inflation so the, the chart on the left actually shows supply is unchanged here demand has increased so there is an increase in quantity which is your your gdp increases but there is significant inflation as well but if you look at the chart on the right here where you know demand has increased here but supply has also increased and when you know demand and supply increase then your gdp increases but you don't get as much inflation some some inflation does happen but not as much this is a key principle that has actually driven india's economic response that we need to we needed to work on both demand and supply not just demand because if we only increase demand that would have actually led to you know going forward um, when the economy actually recovers you know much much more you know and run away inflation uh the second prince so this is basically the sort of just in words when only aggregate demand is raised in the economy without any change in aggregate supply through increases in revenue expenditure which is something i'm going to just talk about the gdp growth that results comes with high inflation but 
when aggregate demand and aggregate supply are increased in the economy through structural reforms and public uh, you know expenditure on capital uh, the growth that results does not come as much with high inflation i'll give you an evidence of uh, some evidence of this as well of these principles in just a, just a few minutes the second principle that 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 you know really uh, you know, that that impacted or that was that underlied india's economic response was that if you do only revenue expenditure if you increase only revenue expenditure that is myopic you know while increasing capital expenditure is far sighted and gives you much more bang for the buck um, so there is this nipfp study which actually shows that when government increases revenue expenditure by rupees 100 only 98 or 99 gets added to the economy so about 1 or 2 rupees actually gets lost um, there is no multiplier effect of the increase in the revenue expenditure and therefore this is basically it just creates impact that year you know of the, that that but there's no impact at all going forward in contrast when the government increases capital expenditure by 100 rupees uh, 245 rupees gets added to the economy in the same year um, you know th th it comes of course through jobs and um, you know demand creation which i'm going to talk about you know in this ne next couple of slides but when you increase capital expenditure when government increases capital expenditure by 100 245 rupees gets added in the same year in other words about 2.5 is the multiplier in the same year from capex and about four, and 480 rupees gets added in aggregate over next several years the, the over the lifetime of that capital expenditure so the impact is first large and second it extends over time and therefore compared to revenue expenditure increasing revenue expenditure increasing capital expenditure is a far sighted policy response just increasing revenue expenditure is myopic while increasing capital expenditure is far sighted uh, given given the given given this this uh, evidence um the third principle is that capital expenditure increases both demand and supply while revenue expenditure increases only demand now related to the first principle that i spoke about the reason for this is i think all of you would understand very well revenue expenditure only puts money in the hands of people in the short term and you know transfers that are given in crises do not provide assurance to people that there's a permanent in, you know increase in their income because you know households will know that this step this you know transfer that has been given may be withdrawn and if because of that uncertainty you know when transfers are given people save a lot more that they don't go and spend on it in terms of so the increase in demand actually is not as sharp and this has been seen not only in india but also in other countries a lot of macroeconomic research has highlighted that revenue expenditure does not increase the demand as much um, so the increase in demand is not a sustained one and there is no increase in supply as no assets are built in this process when you do only only revenue expenditure in contrast when capital expenditure is increased construction activity goes up jobs are created in informal and formal sectors and nothing like a job to actually increase consumption because it raises permanent income of 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 people um construction activity also has linkages to several sectors such as steel and cement and many others where demand increases because of construction as demand increases in these sectors these sectors go and invest in capital expenditure private private capex goes up and they also hire more people so even on aggregate demand capex actually the you know the, the create sustained aggregate demand while revenue expenditures create it only ephemerally uh, and importantly capital expenditure creates assets increases aggregate supply in the economy apart from reforms capital expenditure also helps in increasing supply in the in the economy so this is the third key principle um, that 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 uh, you know we we basically brought into in, into effect uh, the the final principle was it was that capital expenditure crowds in uh, private in uh, private investment while revenue expenditure crowds out private investment what what is this this is basically this jargon when you have you know uh, a capex more investment comes in from the private sector that is a crowding in while if you do only revenue expenditure because the government borrows into the pool of same loanable funds that pool does not increase you know uh, you have crowding out and that's the fourth and the, and the final principle that has basically driven the uh, policy response economic policy response now let me actually i think the crescendo for the entire economic policy response has been the budget um you know the, the as the honorable prime minister has already mentioned uh, atmanirbhar bharat 1 2 3 were mini budgets 
but the crescendo really came you know in the, in this year's in, in the budget delivered by the honorable finance minister uh, which implements all these principles um, you know in in total uh, <clears throat> And, and before I come to that, let me just actually give you some evidence of these principles in action. Um, so I'm going to contrast the policy response to the global financial crisis by India versus the response to the Asian financial crisis. Again, Indian response. I'm only focusing on Indian response, not on other countries. After the global financial crisis, capital expenditure actually went down. If you go and check the macro numbers, you know, um, in, for, for in, in the interest of time, I'm not giving you the actual numbers, but capital expenditure went down, revenue expenditure went up. Um, and, and, you know, there were no structural reforms that were done at that time. For instance, MSMEs, you know, basically were loaded with a lot of, um, you know, uh, regulations, it's regulation, etc., which actually none of that was eased at that time, you know, and, and therefore, you know, the export response could not happen. So no structural reforms were done and capital expenditure was declined. Um, now, as I showed you based on the principles that I just outlined, when you do only revenue expenditure, no capital expenditure, no reforms, there is no impact on supply. Supply remains static, but demand goes up because of the increase in revenue expenditure. And so you get runaway inflation, which is exactly what happened after the global financial crisis. If you go and check the numbers, you know, the peak inflation was about 14% plus. And we had, you know, double digit inflation for a lot of years uh, because of this. This is just something that, you know, an economic students learns in, you know, in, in Econ 101, that if you just increase demand and, and keep supply the same, that inflation, runaway inflation is what you get. Also, because the growth, you know, uh, growth increased temporarily for, as I had shown you in that, you know, the, when I show those charts, uh, but because the uh, fiscal expansion that happened happened with, through revenue expenditure, no assets were created. See, fiscal, you know, strain that it created, and it also led to a huge increase in current account deficit because when demand increased, what happened is that, you know, because domestic supply did not respond, you know, a lot of people basically started doing imports. Impre imports increased significantly. Exports, nothing happened because there were no reforms that were done. And so the current account deficit deteriorated very sharply. So we, India had high inflation, high fiscal deficit and high current account deficit. So all the three, three came together. And that is why India had the macro crisis in 2013, the taper tantrum. So this was basically, this came from the principles, the policies that were followed at that time. In contrast, if you look at the Asian financial crisis, at that time, capital expenditure was stepped up a lot. Um, the golden quadrilateral was built after that, you know, um, and, and structural reforms were done. Um, the, you know, the new telecom policy was implemented at that time, and that's what led to the telecom revolution. The, um, you know, uh, also the, the uh, small scale reservations were removed at that time, which actually created, um, you know, increase in supply. The, uh, the, the uh, investment that happened, CapEx also brought in, you know, uh, the, the private investment and private investment increased significantly over, over the over subsequent years. As a result of that, we had 8% gr plus growth and there was no high inflation at that time. Uh, and I, I think the data bear out actually what I, sh what I have just outlined in terms of the, of the principles. The, and that 8% growth happened several years without any macro crisis, even though the debt to GDP ratio, in fact, at that time went to 83%, it was a, it, it's a historical high. So debt to GDP ratio went to 83% because of the, you know, the, the public capex that was done. Despite that, there was no macro crisis that happened during the, you know, after the Asian financial crisis. Again, illustration of the principles that I've just outlined. COVID crisis, India's response basically follows the same template as that after the successful, the su successful template of the Asian financial crisis, which is, you know, but at much higher scale, which is reforms have been far more impactful, lot more labor reforms, you know, MSME definitional changes, the private interest you know, price policy, um, you know, opening up of several sectors, financial sector reforms now, you know, announced in the budget, the, the public sector DFI, you know, and enabling of private sector DFI, Lots of them actually in the interest of time, not going to go into the reforms that have been at a much higher scale and public capex also is going to be at a much higher scale, both on the soft side, which is health and on infrastructure, actually infrastructure, you know, the, the, the budget estimate for the coming year at about, you know, two and a half percent of GDP in capex is, you know, uh, is a historical high uh, in terms of both rupees and, you know, in terms of percentage GDP, it is, it, it is a high. So, as I said, the budget basically has been the crescendo 
for the uh, you know for for the economic policy response so let me just you know spend a couple of minutes on that many of you have seen it but i'll give you a sort of a, a macro perspective on the budget on why i think this actually lays out the path for for growth um, not only in the coming year recovery but also you know as the first budget of this this decade lays out the foundation for sustained growth over the entire you know decade um, so healthcare the 135% increase um, you know and both on prevention and on cure so prevention by the way drinking water sanitation are all part of preventive healthcare and therefore it's very important you know when you put that to 100 and put that together 134% increase in healthcare which impacts labor supply and labor productivity it really increases labor productivity and you know healthcare has been shown to improve labor supply and labor productivity um, <clears throat> infrastructure funding infrastructure funding has been focused on three primary areas railways roads and power and i'll again give you the macro perspective of how this basically impacts uh, infrastructure focused on railways and roads you know really impact logistics costs so our firms as this infrastructure gets rolled out and the impact of that comes for the economy logistics costs actually should go down uh, infrastructure focused on power will you know help in reducing the cost of production because power is a very important input for the for production especially in manufacturing so you know both these um, uh, these these you know aspects of infrastructure which is roads and railways and power will actually affect the the factors of production um, public infrastructure as i've already said crowds in private investment triggers the virtuous cycle of investment growth and consumption uh, this virtuous cycle was something that we had highlighted in the economic survey of 2018 19 where we had shown that we basically looked at countries that grew at 5% plus growth rate for at least a decade so 5% plus growth for at least a decade and what we found was that each country implemented this virtuous cycle of investment which led to economic growth which led to higher consumption and thereby anticipating higher consumption more more private investment that's how the virtuous cycle that's what led to growth across all these countries so uh, the public infrastructure can trigger that virtuous cycle you know in in the and that's why a very important part of the budget financial sector reforms affect the other factor of production which is capital and the enterprise policy policy focused on private sector can improve productivity so labor capital productivity and the other factors of production others thing like like logistics costs and your you know and and power costs all these have been covered so from a macroeconomic perspective you know all boxes have been ticked on what actually accounts for 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 gdp in in the country um so let me let me just uh, you know summarize at this point in time uh, in my opinion actually in my uh, well studied opinion if i would if i can actually uh, you know take the, the liberty to say uh, based on the analysis that's been done in the economic survey uh, india's response has been a mature far sighted one uh, the policy response to the covid pandemic as i've highlighted india focused on saving lives and livelihoods took short term pain for long term gain and thereby has converted this trade off between lives and livelihoods in the short term into saving both lives and you know enabling economic recovery Uh, india cal you know the demand side policies were calibrated we pushed the accelerator only when the brakes were removed and thereby saved fuel or in other words you know uh, you know very very crucial fiscal space india was the only country to announce structural reforms to take care of supply side uh, you know and enhance supply and also public capex you know to trigger the virtuous cycle of investment growth and consumption also adding to the supply side you know in that process uh, with a v shaped economic recovery that is happening without a second wave uh, you know this makes and while while cases are coming down mobility is increasing so india is a sui sui generis case in mature policy making in my opinion um, you know when history looks at india's uh, india's policy response um, you know this given that this is a, a pandemic that came after after 100 years history will indeed look at how india responded to this pandemic and history will uh, you know will will be will be uh, very very uh, you know uh, uh, appreciative in india's uh, you know in india's policy response um, finally the mega vaccination drive um, that is on should also enable recovery in services because the fear of you know of contact big services 
would would reduce with vaccination um, and so overall i think um, you know again i must i must uh, emphasize that it is the decision makers that deserve all the credit for having had the maturity to take some short term pain for long term gain and india has actually benefited from from their maturity thank you very much